Hi, everybody. Give me a second to get used to hearing my own voice that always takes me off for the first time. So first of all, thank you for picking this talk. I know the competing selection of talks is extremely tempting, and I, I'm also tempted to attend them. But I'm very happy for each and every one of you that decided to be in this room right now with me. So uh, my name is Adam Volk. Uh, I am currently a program manager at uh, Microsoft uh, doing distributed PostgreSQL with the Citus team. I'm, I'm, I'm also an OpenBDSD developer, though recently a slacker, as I didn't have enough time to contribute. But what I really want to talk about today is PostgreSQL and taming the growth of your database from the perspective of an application developer that comes maybe from Oracle or some other database, or looking through the eyes of their own framework and learning how to prevent some problems instead of solving the symptoms after they happen. So you might heard this thing called multi-version concurrency control with PostgreSQL. That's essentially how we handle concurrency, uh, which means that every SQL statement does a snapshot of time. Uh, and thanks to this, there's less log contention, reads on block writes, writes on block reads, and stuff like that. We won't dive very deep into all of that, but what I want to dive slightly into is uh, copy on write. And I know that term is not often repeated in the PostgreSQL community, but it's repeated in file systems like ZFS uh, from the BSDs. So copy and write means that whenever you're making a change, you're copying the data you're changing. And it happens that that's exactly how multi-version concurrency in PostgreSQL works. So when you're modifying a row, a copy of that row is made, all modifications are done on the copy, but what happens with the previous data? It sticks around. Now, there are some uh, things that expose that mechanism to you. There are hidden columns in uh, every PostgreSQL table called xmin, xmax, ctid. Uh, xmin is the transaction ID that uh, brought the row into life, like created it. xmax uh, is the one that last seen it, essentially. So, uh, and CTID is the physical location of the row on disk. Like it's a tuple of two values. The first value is which page, and the second value is which tuple on that page it, the row resides in. So the, the funny thing is, and I don't know if, if you ever read the paper on architecture of PostgreSQL, uh, it's linked here. There is a passage there on this nice feature that PostgreSQL has. And don't be fooled, that's not SQL, that's prequel, the language that was used in PostgreSQL before SQL was used in uh, PostgreSQL. Uh, PG had a feature called time travel, where you could say, I want to query uh, the employee table where at this specific point in time. And how was that done? It was, it was possible because all the previous copies of that row were still on disk. So you can check at a certain transaction time what happened. Now, what's the problem with those copies sticking around? You may have heard the term bloat. So what is bloat and why too much bloat is bad and later on why some bloat may be good. So essentially, uh, bloat most often is referred to as those copies of rows that we have from making modifications that were not cleaned up. So you modify the row five times, now you have five copies of the same data residing on your disk. That's redundant data, that has some implications on performance, how? Uh, so PG stores rows in uh, pages, they are eight kilobytes of size. Each tuple takes some space in such a page, and those pages form segments, and segments form tables. So Imagine that you have tightly packed data and PG works in pages. If you want to read 30 rows and all of those rows fit into one page, that's one eye of read operation from disk of four kilobytes. But what happens if your data is spread out across 10 pages, same amount of data? Because you have so much bloat in between the, the live rows 
that it has to read 10 times more from disk to get the same amount of live rows. So you're increasing IOPS, you're increasing memory because that page has to be paged in from disk into working memory. Uh, and obviously, uh, the, the first thing that people realize, it takes away the precious hard drive. So you're woken up at night, the database uh, disk is slowly decreasing in capacity, and you are woken up because there is no more storage space. Now somebody has to clean something up. And that's not always fun. So how do you fight with that? And we will pivot off that later. Uh, the first thing that, that you learn is, oh, you badly tuned your vacuums or you didn't do vacuums. What are vacuums? Vacuums are a way to go uh, and tell the database, like, go over this table, uh, vacuum it, which is go over all the tuples, make sure that if it's no longer needed, like there's no transaction currently running that should be able to still see that row, we may mark it as reusable. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean that the data goes back to the operating system and can be used again. It doesn't magically make your disk usage re reduce, right? But what it will do is it will say this place on disk is reusable. So the next time an update comes, it will overwrite that specific uh, place on drive, right? So the way you should think about it is like a watermark in the pool. So whenever you are working in, in a table uh, in PG, the watermark is raising to a certain point, and as data is being vacuumed, it will slowly go down and up, but it will not decrease below the water point. The, the high watermark will remain in place or will go over, right? Uh, so you can vacuum manually. It also does some other interesting things, the, the vacuum. It builds a visibility map. And if you have a visibility map, you can avoid doing some fetches of tuples from disks, so you're reducing I.O. And you may see that often uh, that your first query is slow, but your second query is fast, because that vacuums are not the only things that do visibility maps. And the, the often misconception is, oh, the first query did some caching. No, the, the first query built a visibility map, and that visibility map helps you avoid some extra work later. And vacuuming also helps with that. It also freezes transaction IDs. So those xmin, xmax values are transaction IDs. And PG has uh, this transaction identifier, which is a very large but finite number, that's used in a ring-like way that goes uh, over the, it goes around essentially. And it's used to mark specific rows with uh, this was created with this transaction, this was last seen by this transaction, etc. So what happens if you run out of these numbers? Well, you get woken up if you're a DBA, because that means that you, very likely your database was warning you for weeks before that happened that, hey, you're running out of these numbers, but you didn't look into the logs. And then it decided, okay, if you're not going to do anything about that, then I'm shutting down. And it's very good that it did that, because it would be much worse if it didn't. Uh, it does that when it still has some IDs left, so that you can boot it up in single user mode and do the vacuuming and cleanup so that you regain some of those IDs. And freeze processing in vacuums essentially goes over the rows when it sees a transaction that's no longer seen by any backend, so a PostgreSQL connection doing queries, it will take, like, it will remove that the unique uh, transaction ID from that row, it will replace it with a constant value that's treated as a frozen transaction, and that value can be reused. It also does some other stuff like removing uh, C log entry files, uh, vacuum full, so vacuuming doesn't restore space to the operating system. Uh, vacuum full does, but vacuum full does something more. It does like an, oh, it, it rewrites the table on the side. So when you are doing vacuum full, you have to know that you are essentially making a second copy of all your data on the side, which likely will end up smaller than the source table, but you have to assume that during that process you will use maybe twice as much storage, and it will take time 
and it will take clocks. So your application may not really like you doing vacuum fools. And also it updates the free space map, which also allows some optimizations. And ah, I see an error on my slide. I had the visibility map twice. Sorry about that. Uh, and also vacuum analyze can gather statistics, which al also helps performance. But being so, uh, it, it, we are lazy by nature and we forget to do vacuums. And also it's hard to find a good spot, good place to vacuum. Like how often should I do it? So there's this nice thing, auto vacuum. Uh, auto vacuum fires more frequently, doing slightly less work than a big vacuum would. The most important thing that it does, so like from the perspective of being woken up, is preventing transaction ID wraparound. That's a vacuum that many people try to kill, find out that they can't kill it, and it's good that you can't kill it. Don't kill uh, the prevent uh, transaction ID wraparound vacuum. Let it finish or help it finish if you can because it will prevent you being woken up. Uh, it can help with gathering statistics and all the previous stuff that we did. So uh, auto vacuum fires up when a certain amount of rows changes that's configurable, a uh, certain uh, percentage of rows in the database changes that's also configurable, so a certain amount of rows are inserted in fairly newer versions of PostgreSQL, not in some older ones like 10, for example, um, and such. So if you might have like seen uh, the, the first thing, like when you are healing, like you, you have load and somebody comes in as a consultancy and helps you, okay, you're badly tuned with vacuums. That's true, that's solving the problem. So my approach to vacuuming is, uh, doctor, it hurts when I do it, so with vacuums, do it more often. Uh, that's counterintuitive, but it's much easier to frequently vacuum small amounts of rows instead of vacuuming gigabytes or terabytes of data at once. Now, vacuum has something called a budget that's configurable, and the defaults are very low. It tells you how much megabytes per second or kilobytes by default per second it can read and write on, on, to disk on every second of operation. And if it exceeds that threshold, threshold, it holds back. So what will often happen is you will see tables that are never vacuumed because there's one big table that's trying to vacuum 30 gigabytes with a very low budget. It never finishes. The budget is shared across all tables in the database and no other, data, no other table is vacuumed. And it leads to such amazing situations that I saw uh, at the, in a real application, production application, a table with 12 kilobytes of live data that grew to 20 gigabytes of di on disk storage. And it grew by essentially synchronizing uh, rows from Active Directory, like 20 or 30 users from Active Directory into a user's table. It did that by updating every row in the table because if it didn't change, there's no change, right? And some other big table was locking up vacuuming. So those new rows were never vacuumed. And then you can have like the 12 kilobytes taking 20 gigabytes or some other excessive stuff happening. So vacuum more frequently, tune that. You can tune vacuum per table. You can tune uh, statistics, uh, sorry, not statistic, but the the points of when it should run. So for example, run it every 5% of table, big t a big table being changed, etc. But this talk is not about tuning vacuums. That's why I'm rushing over it. Uh, but before we get further, there is also uh, something called write amplification. So when you have copy on write, you're creating a row every time you're modifying data. What happens if that row has indexes on it. Well, you most likely need to create a copy of data in every index, and that's hurtful. Imagine a table that has 10 indexes on 10 columns. You, make, you change one value of, the col of one column, and you have 11 writes instead of one. So you have a copy, and you have an entry in every index. That's very hurtful for performance, but fortunately, PG has a very nice optimization called heap-only tuples updates. Uh, 
so hot updates for short. And the way it works is FPG knows that the column you are changing in your update is not indexed and is not used in any index like partial index, etc. And, and even if it's present in the query, the value that's set on it is not changing, then a hot update may happen. And in that case, when there's enough room in the current page, we talked about, about PG storing uh, eight kilobyte pages of data, uh, like working pages of eight kilobytes. And if that page is not full, it has room for another copy of our row, then it may decide that instead of creating a new tuple somewhere else and all the entries in the indexes, it will create a sibling tuple in the same page and, and will just make a pointer from the old tuple to the new tuple so that you have a daisy chain of pointers that you can follow. And that way all the previous indexes don't need to change because the value didn't change. An index would find the old tuple, the old tuple points to the new tuple and everything sees the latest state. And that allows you to prevent uh, bloat on the indexes. And this is also the, the counterintuitive fact that some bloat might help or decreasing fill factor, which is a setting on tables, might help the, if you are having trouble finding space for hot updates in your tuples because it needs to have space in the same page. Uh, it also, uh, when hot updates happen, at a certain point, the DB will decide, okay, I can now do an inline mini vacuum. So the way that works is uh, in the current page, maybe one tuple was updated five times. So it can in place just work on that page and get rid of all the previous ones, marking them as reusable without launching a full vacuum or without relying on out of vacuum happening. So you want hot updates. They save you IO, they save you time. And I know it's hard to Imagine how hot updates work, so let's try to go through uh, an example. Uh, this is how uh, hot updates would look without, uh, sorry, this is how updates would look without the hot update mechanism, right? So uh, we have the first row here marked as 00. zero. This is our CTID, and it has three columns. Uh, the first column has value AA, the second column has value, value BB, the, sec the third column has value CA. And we have two indexes, uh, ignore the lower entries for now. Index one, index two, let's imagine they are on column A and on column B. And the first uh, index has the value AA copied into it and it points to that row. And the second one has the BB value. Now, what we are doing is we are running an update of the C column from CA to CB. So what happens is PG creates a copy of the whole row with all the values in it. Uh, we see the CTID changed. We are still in the same page because we had room. If we didn't have room, maybe we are in the other page, but we are in the first page for now. And we have the first tuple. So we had the zero tuple, now we have the first one. And what happens is we get additional new entries in both indexes because, well, there's no optimization yet, right? If we do yet another update of the same column that's not indexed, we get again a full copy of the row and again a new entry in every index. So at the end we have uh, two dead tuples and one live tuple and two dead entries in both indexes and one live entry in both indexes. So a lot of data. Now let's go further. Uh, when we have hot updates, the same scenario goes slightly differently. Uh, we have the same uh, outgoing state. We change the column CA to CB. And what happens? We still get a full copy of the tuple itself within the same page. But what happens is this row now points to this row. So this does, doesn't have to change. When I query, when I do a query that uses the index, the, this index will point me to this row and this row will point me to the li currently live tuple. So no new entry is needed because I didn't change any of the indexed columns, right? If I change CB to CC, again, I get this live, uh, new live row, uh, another dead tuple, but here we have no change 
we don't need to change the indexes. And if we continued this at some point in place, these two would be marked as reusable with a mini vacuum, or maybe a normal vacuum would do it, uh, or auto vacuum because it happened. It happened to happen before the mini vacuum kicked in. Okay, so when can hot updates be prevented? Imagine that uh, you have a partial index on this uh, column, maybe column C. Maybe this is a soft delete column. A lot of apps now like to do. You deleted the row, but you can still undo it. So you have maybe a deleted or last seen at column. And you often want the, that column to be uh, quick for, for filtering because you don't want to see dead tuples in your live application. That from the perspective of this is soft deleted. So you index, uh, like create index uh, ID where uh, deleted not true, right? So whenever you delete a tuple and let's say CA to CB is deletion of a record, you would uh, make an entry in the index on, on that third column or an, or an entry in the index that uses the partial where clause and that prevents hot updates from happening. So again, we have the same scenario like if that optimization was not present, every update now prevents hot updates and you're generating bloat in your indexes that wouldn't be necessary. So keep that in mind. So with this, Doctor, it hurts when I do this, then don't do that. And by don't do that, I mean uh, try to learn when you are creating excessive rows in your application. Like think what PostgreSQL is doing underneath and what your application is doing. So understand when data is copied, prevent generating that bloat, don't copy patterns. So some databases have patterns that you may know, like, oh, that's performant. And it's performant because, for example, Oracle has a read log and not, it's not doing copy and write. And we will go through two examples like that. Uh, and you know your tools, essentially. So uh, what we will do right now is I will briefly describe a Django and Oracle scenario. Then I will show you them like in code. Uh, but to optimize switching between like the presentation and terminal, I will just go over the slides and then we will swap to the terminal. So with Django ORM, some things that you should know is uh, if you are updating uh, PG in PG, if you are doing an update, and you are updating a the, the only thing that your update is doing is column A equals column A. So absolutely no change. A copy of the row will still be made. It will be likely a hot update if that column is not uh, in any way uh, indexed, but it will be uh, copied. Uh, old uh, not equal new value is hot update prevented, as we explained before. Use save update fields and look what fields your application is using and be extremely careful with um, auto fields with Django, for example. So if you use save in Django, it will include all fields in the model in the update query, even if none of them changed. And if one of them happens to be an auto field, and that auto field is used in any of the uh, maybe created at or last updated at columns, and it's used in an index somewhere, then that will prevent hot updates for that. So that will be the demo in a second. Now with Oracle, in Oracle there's this nice pattern. You, you can't really fit an elephant into an Oracle rack. I didn't try, but I guess so. Uh, so there's this thing called row ID in Oracle. And people love to use row ID for efficient queries because it's just locating a row on disk. It's very efficient, has a fast path in Oracle database. It's not safe to use just that. You should also still look up by primary key because row ID can change if you're migrating a row between partitions, for example, in Oracle. But the worst thing that people do is they go to Google and type in uh, Oracle row ID equivalent in PostgreSQL and they get the answer CTID. And I saw that in production that someone did insert into some job queue uh, and get CTID and they stored CTID in the external application. Now they did some processing, they updated, 
that row with CTID by CTID, that's okay, it changed, but they didn't update the CTID in the application. And now, after a while, they're running delete this row by CTID, and now they deleted a random row from the database. And that's a live use case, because every update changes the CTID. If a vacuum runs, it will be reused by another row at some point. So you can't assume that you can safely use CTID as a specific identifier. Uh, you may be tempted to, if you come from Oracle, to do soft deletes because they are faster. Why are they faster in Oracle uh, than plain deletes? Because if you have a read lock, what a read lock is, when I'm modifying a row, I'm writing on the side what I did. So when I have to roll back, I look here and I, do, I redo the change that I have done to get back to the initial state. So I'm storing my actions that I have to undo. So if I'm deleting a row, I'm doing much work. But if, if I'm just soft updating, I can update this row in place, and I'm only doing a small like record, how would I revert that? So that's less work than deleting a row. In PostgreSQL, if you are doing a soft delete, you are creating a copy of the whole row, and likely a copy of every row in the index if you have a self-deleted field that's indexed, right? So suddenly that's not very performance, uh, so the tombstone can prevent uh, the hot updates. So let's go to the uh, demos. And I hope that I will fit in time. And to save some time, I will uh, excuse the flipping between the terminal window and the code. I will just copy some longer queries to save uh, yours and my time. Okay, so uh, I'm going to make sure that I don't have the database ready, and I'm going to create a database pgconf for this p first example. Uh, and the first example will be the Oracle delete uh, demo, right? So uh, we have the database pgconf, let's connect to it. And let's create a very simple table. Uh, a, it has just a primary key and a deleted Boolean uh, flag. We can see it. We can query the rows from it. Uh, there is nothing here, so let's insert a very simple row that's just one value. Uh, I have two rows now, okay? Doesn't matter. Uh, it has just an idea and a deleted not field. Now, if you remember the hidden fields from uh, the beginning of this talk, so we had CTID, Xmin, Xmax, uh, Xmax, sorry, uh, and you can see, uh, you can see that we have the CTIDs, so the zeroth page, first row, second row, transaction identifiers that created these records uh, this is zero because there's nothing that caused this row to be removed, IDs of this row, and the deleted flag. And we can check the, the current transaction identifier of PostgreSQL, and you can see that this is something that changes for every query, right? So we know roughly where we are at uh, in the transaction space. So uh, let's go a bit deeper and let's create this extension called page inspect, uh, sorry, that allows us to look into the uh, internal representation on disk of how the rows look. So now we have the row outputs. This is the same. That's uh, CTID, TMIN, TMAX, and now that's the tuple data uh, split. So this is the primary key, this is the first row, the second row, and the, f the Boolean delete flags are zero now, okay? So now we can look at what happens with, if we, we would query by t CTID, we can see that PG indeed also has a special scan method for going over CTIDs, but it's not worth uh, the randomness of this value changing in most cases. So um, what else can we do? We can check that there's this amazing PGStat user tables view that you can query for things, how many hot updates were done on this table? And there were none because we didn't do any updates. We just created two rows in it. But let's uh, 
do a soft delete. And I'm going to do a soft delete by CTID to just show you that it works. So I uh, updated the first row and I set the uh, deleted flag to true. And I'm going to show you the basic output of the table. And in the basic output, you can see that we have the row O2 unchanged, deleted to false, ID2. And you can see this one like went down, it's O3. So it skipped over this row. Uh, the X-Men changed and the, the ID remained the same and the deleted flag changed. So now let's look at how that looks on disk, right? So we are, uh, and you will be able to get those queries. I will publish them with the organizer later. So essentially, if we look at the data here, and this extension allows us to see the dead tuples, the, the ones that are not yet reclaimed, we can see that this is the previous tuple. It has uh, the, the first transaction identifier the, the when, when that we had previously. The 1085 identifier, which is the update that we executed that created this row, the, all the previous values, and the new value. We see the, the same primary key, but we see that the flag is now true. So you see the change from 00, 00 to 01 in this row. So you can see the copy that was created on the data. Now, that update was uh, hot. And we can check that by running the stat user statements. And we can see that there's, on, there's one hot update executed on this table. So if we look at the page items of the primary key. So the primary key on this table has an index, as every primary key should. Uh, and we are looking at the first page of that index. And what we are having is only two entries, not three entries. So we had two live tuples after the update. We still have two live tuples, and we have two live tuples in the B tree. And that's great. What would happen if we didn't have a hot update? We would have additional entries in the index. So let's uh, force it slightly. So now we are creating a live ID index, uh, like live index. So all the tuples that were not deleted, right? So when I have this index present, I'm going to run the query on the primary key again, and I'm going to run the query on the live index. The live index right now only has one entry because only one row right now is alive because one of them is soft deleted, right? So if we uh, soft delete uh, and my CTIDs are now changed, so I'm not sure what I am deleting or not deleting. So instead, to, to make it more uh, sane, I'm going to just do deletions this way. Uh, so let's soft delete uh, update A set uh, deleted true, where uh, ID equals two, which is our column that's currently not soft deleted. Okay, so we run this, and what happens now? If we look at the data on the table itself, so this big query, we can see that we have yet another copy, uh, row four, it's deleted, so we have two dead tuples for uh, the undeleted rows and two live tuples for the sub-deleted rows. Now if we look at the um, live index, it has only one entry right now, uh, which is the dead tuple. And if we look at the, uh, sorry, and if we look at the primary key, it has another entry. So now if we undelete, oh, and uh, let's look at the live tuples. Uh, sorry, if we have, if we had a hot update. Yeah, and that wasn't a hot update. So we had one hot update from the first soft delete we run an update right now and it did, wasn't a self delete. So let's uh, do this again by restoring one of the tuples. So we will mark it as deleted false and uh, not with two rows, I'm not guessing, so let's do this. And if we look at it, we have one of them back, uh, ID one is back, with flag zero, if we query the table, 
uh, we see that there are only two rows all the time, right? Uh, and if you look at the indexes, the primary key has four rows now, and the live index has two rows now. So instead, if you just did the plain delete, what would happen is there is no copy, even for the main tuple. It just sets the max transaction identifier to the row that was deleted. There are no longer any changes to the indexes because the row was just deleted. You don't need to make sure that the index points to a new copy of the row that's the soft deleted row. So in most cases, you don't want to copy that pattern from Oracle that soft deletes are faster. Obviously, you may need them for your application for business purposes, and that's good. But if you are doing them just because that's more performant, then try to verify if what's more performant on Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server, or whatever, is more performant on PG in the way it does copy on writes. And let's quickly go over the Django demo. Uh, so let's quit from this. pgconf, create database pgconf. Uh, and I have this here. So I, I have a very basic Django application from the Django tutorial, like maybe the first section of the pools tutorial set up. I'm not going to even run it fully, but what, w what we are going to do is uh, currently th this is, uh, sorry, let's connect to pgconf. Uh, this database is empty. We are going to run the migration. I think I have to go to my site. Sorry, I didn't do Django in a while. Let's migrate. Now we have a bunch of tables. Mostly it's the admin interface and the pools choice pool questions table. And what we will do is we will run this fancy uh, shell plus with print SQL feature, which uh, prints print, print, printed SQL for all the queries that the Django ORM runs. And I will just copy paste uh, some module imports to speed things up and we can run a query to like see what happens when you execute something and let's move this up so uh, what i did here is like i executed question objects all which is which translates to select everything from pools question these fields limit 21 because that's i think the default paging that django implements and we can see the query and there are no results because the database is obviously empty, which is fine. So let's uh, do the example from the tutorial. Uh, we are going to uh, create a question object uh, like with two values on the fields. And it's not yet created. We call save on it. And what happens is we are saving for the first time, so it does an insert, right? And we can uh, do select all from uh, pools question. And you can see uh, the question being added. What's new and some like dates. That's all that we have here, right? And that's great. Uh, and I didn't change anything. And I'm running save again. What will happen? Great, it runs an update. And it runs an update that updates every field of the model. And you might say, okay, that's cool. I didn't change anything. Nothing changed here, right? But we just saw what happens when you just run an update in PG. We made a copy of the row. So we copied data. And you can imagine how easily that's done in a Python script that synchronizes users over AAD, uses Django or M, and that does just user save because we didn't change any fields, but let's make sure that we are saving anything. So don't make assumptions that, oh, it will only update the, the fields that change, or it will only do SQL queries if something changed. Verify that. Because you may be generating bloat that, that's not needed. And then you are having vacuuming problems that you should not be having even if you didn't tune your vacuums more, right? That's the, the main takeaway. So what happens if we save it again? 
obviously it will do the update again. Uh, and I, what, what you can do, like to, to give you some solutions, you can run objects filter primary key one update this specific field and that will work. It will update just this field. But keep in mind that you may have a, a field that's an auto field that you want to update, so make sure that you're updating the fields that you previously relied on Django to update. Uh, and you might say, oh, I'm not preventing hot updates, like I, I know the indexes I have, but do you know the triggers that you have that may also change the fields based on what other fields are changing and they may prevent hot updates as a consequence of that. So that's one thing. Uh, what else you can do, you can also run the save command itself, uh, but using the update fields. And with the update fields, uh, you can see it also updated only the fields that I listed. So you can prevent up Django from updating all the fields in your database. So if we create the uh, page inspect ex extension again, because this is um, a new database. Mm -hmm. Ah, wrong shell, yeah, <laughs> thanks. And I was looking for typos as I was typing it again. Okay, uh, so uh, we can look at this table. Uh, it may be less visible with wrapping, but You've seen this before in the previous example. This is slightly longer, but the first one is the primary key, and these are the, the timestamps that are changing, and you can see the copies uh, of the rows created, right? And essentially, the example is uh, very similar. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, I want to create a partial index on pools where updated at uh, is larger than uh, this year, right? Uh, and if we check the hot updates on this table, mm, where do I have that query? Yeah. If we check hot, hot updates on this table, we have four, because that, that's roughly the amount of times I did save before, so each time I did Q save on the object, it did a hot update because none of the columns that I was updating was indexed. It did up include like, I think it didn't include the primary key, but even if it did include the primary key, the value of the primary key didn't change. So it still wouldn't prevent hot updates from happening. But what's different right now is in the Django model for this object, I have an auto field. And since I have this open here, I can actually sh show you. I have an auto field for updated at out and out true, okay? And what that means that each time I'm running update in Django, it's generating a new timestamp and setting a new timestamp on the database. So right now, when I created this partial index for all the pools that were updated this year, then each time I'm running uh, a safe operation in Django, right? This value changed, and let's run it again. This value changes between each run, so it, it was uh, 4616, it's now 4624, and we can see that the hot updates right now are not changing. We know we are making updates, but the hot updates are not changing. So if you look again into the table and what happens uh, with the indexes, uh, you can see we are getting more and more rows created. We are up to, up to seven. And if you look at the indexes, so the primary key of this table, there's only one row in this table and the primary key now has three entries. We know we did over like four updates before and we all, all that time we only had one entry in the B3. And now uh, with hot updates prevented, Anytime I'm doing an update, I'm bloating this index with yet another copy of the row. And not only that index, if this table had 10 indexes, I'm making a new entry in every one of them. And that's one thing to think about also because often when you, when somebody comes like, my query is slow, okay, I'll just create an index. 
when you are doing that, think how that query, like how those columns that you are indexing are used in queries in update queries, because maybe you are preventing hot updates from happening. Uh, and with that, uh, that that brings us back to the uh, slides and to the end of the presentation, and I, I'm leaving some time for questions. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, one at the back. Hello. Hi. Uh, when you were doing the soft delete update, uh, there were two rows and you deleted one, but when we saw the list of the tuples, there were three tuples, and the first one had the CTID of 03 and not 01, as I would expect, yes. because I don't know much about it. So why was that? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I assume, uh, I, I'm not sure if that's just the extension or the actual change on disk. I assume it might be the, a change on disk. My assumption, not verified yet, but I also noticed that, is that when we can do hot updates, it will point to the next live tuple. Uh, but to a certain, like I'm, I'm not yet sure what drives it because I later saw that they are not updated in a daisy chain. So, so the last two I see that the previous one points at the last one entered. Then maybe that happens when they share the, the modification. I'm not sure, I would need to look that up. Uh, but I will be happy if you take my email here and ping me that, because I will look that up and I will share what I find with you. So please do that. Any, Any other, other questions? questions? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so you mentioned uh, tr triggers actually also being able to, to uh, block uh, hot updates the, the same way uh, as indexes do. So uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate more on that. Sure. Uh, I can give you an example. So uh, I saw a product that used, uh, they, they, they had a received add column and it was used for synchronizing rows between databases. And there was a trigger that made sure that the last modification of the row was uh, had the, the value of like received that updated. And since it was used for synchronization, uh, these columns were indexed so that uh, when the queries were made to make sure like, like what's the last received row, that they were optimized. Now, uh, there were before triggers that modified the value of the received that column as it was incoming to make sure that it's the latest value. So even if you didn't have that column in place in the query, the trigger would insert it in, into the newly updated row essentially. And that would still prevent hot updates from happening and that whole product didn't have hot updates because of that on all tables. Thank you. I think we've got time for one or two more questions, if there's anything. There's one. Up front. Uh, as I understand, you work uh, in uh, junk development. Is any differences in implementations junk models uh, for different databases, PostgreSQL or MySQL, and have you some statistics about uh, efficiency of the right. databases? Uh, so so I, as I understand, you're asking if there are uh, modules that account for the, the way this works uh, in Django and other databases? Uh, did I, yes. Uh, I have not, like I did, throughout research and how easy it is to make SQL injection uh, errors in various Django and uh, Python modules. But I didn't look at it from the aspect of uh, copying data and generating data. That, that's a very interesting thing to look at and I will gladly update this talk on the next iteration with such research. Thank you for pointing it out. Okay, I think that's all we've got time for. So uh, thank you very much, Adam, and a big round of applause again. Thank you.